so what I've got here is a solar cell. It's one of those garden lights. You stick it in the garden and the solar cell charges the battery. You get lights at night. I've pulled it out and what I'm going to do is take some aluminium and cover it over so the light can't get to it. Let's apply a little heat. Now isn't that both curious and interesting? This thing, the solar cell which responds to light, turns out it will all respond to heat. The other curious thing about this is if I put power in this, well I can actually get it to light up. It actually lights in the infrared, but it will act as a light if I put power in. So not only will it respond to different kinds of energy, it will also reverse itself. We can get electricity out by light in and we can get light out by electricity in and you've got to ask yourself okay why well it does that because it's two semiconductors put together an n and a p and they are full of either spare electrons or spare holes and we can either shove those across or we can let them drift the other way and being a reversible process and immediately you should ask really i suppose that if it works with this particular semiconductor device would it work with other semiconductor devices well we know that We've taken this, remember, which is a, a 2N2022 transistor, chopped the top off, stuck that in the sun, and got that to generate a not inconsiderable amount of energy for the size of the silicon that's in there. The reason it does that, it's a silicon junction. Silicon junctions do that kind of thing when you subject them to an input of an energy or you put electricity in, you'll get that transformation back out. And of course, we've done that with these things as well. It's an LED, which is a um, light emitting diode, but it's a diode, which means it's a semiconductor junction. And we know that we put a bit of electricity in there to light up, and we've shown that if we put the sun on there, we'll get electricity out. So here's my LED connected up to my voltmeter. It's reading on volts, because current, to be honest, is going to be minuscule. But let's see if we can drive a voltage by shining a light on that. And hey, presto, it jumps up. To, well, depends how far away the light is, but there we go, a volt. So they all do it, and they are all reversible. The difference that you get really depends on how they're arranged, how we arrange those junctions to favour one thing or another. So if we want to favour light output, then we do them a certain way. If we want to favour electricity output for light input, then you rearrange them a little bit to do that so that it favours that but they all do all of it it's just that one is favoured above another and they are all reversible this thing which of course is a Peltier device is another arrangement of N and P junctions of semiconductors and we know if we put power in here one side will get hot the other side will get cold if we do the other reverse hot and cold we'll get power back out and I wouldn't mind betting if we could crack that open, I'm not going to because that's about five quid, we would probably emit some light that we could measure as well if we did exactly that, and they probably would respond to light as well. They won't respond as well as a specific arrangement, but they will all respond in exactly the same way and are reversible. Now, this is not something that's escaped people, about 10 years or so ago, a Stanford producer of paper was talking about a theoretical argument about whether solar cells could work from infrared, that is, heat. Could we make them work under heat conditions? And what they um, theorised was the night sky. Silicon is actually a great transmitter of heat, and under the night sky, of course, it gets cold, and it creates a thermal difference, because it's not actually heat that pushes this. Heat creates a thermal difference and that's what matters and it's the same thing with these things. It doesn't, not the direct application of heat, it's the creation of a temperature difference between the hot and the cold side that actually creates the movement and so if you leave a solar cell overnight then during the night it radiates out far much more heat than the ambient and so you get a temperature difference. The top of a solar cell is very much more colder than the back of the solar cell because the back of the solar cell is heated by the ambient and the top is radiating light crazy and so you get a heat difference and they said well, okay you're going to get a heat difference what's that likely to be and how much energy will it generate and it's 
was estimated in that study to be about 50 watts per square meter and of course that made the headlines and didn't do anything for 10 years until now when somebody decided to actually test that rather than theorize about it. The first attempt was to stick one of these on the back of thermoelectric generator but the power was pretty trivial. I think it was 0.04% um, of the output from these and these are actually quite expensive. So in terms of um, cost for energy produced they find that uh, it wasn't actually that brilliant. However, it was looked at again. But this time using something called a thermoradiative diode. Now a transistor is basically two semiconductor junctions and a diode is just one semiconductor junction. And as we've seen already, semiconductors will both emit and absorb photons. When a diode is the same temperature and its whole length, it emits and absorbs photons at exactly the same rate. However, if you create a temperature difference, that is, heat one side or cool the other side, doesn't really matter which, then you will force electron flow across that semiconductor junction. And that's basically how a thermoradiative diode works. Now, as I said earlier, we can tweak these things to get better performance and different materials perform in a different way. And one of the better materials for a thermoradiative diode is mercury cadmium telluride. Which is actually very similar to uh, what's used in infrared cameras. The idea was instead of sticking one of these, a Peltier device, on the back, you could stick on a thermoradiative diode, which is exactly what they did. And this time they got 2.6 milliwatts per square metre. It was Exciton who decided to test it and they found out it worked, of course, and they found out that in that straightforward condition it would give out about 0.001% of the power of the solar cell, which of course is piffling, and nowhere near what the theoretical expectation was. But it is a landmark event that is being described in the papers at the moment as nighttime solar cells. If we look a little bit closer at this, then what we're doing with the thermoradiative diode is effectively creating a cold sink, and that creates a power generation region. But of course there is the opposite side of it. You could create a hot source, and that would equally generate a power region. That hot source on the diode is what thermophotovoltaics are, and it gets its name by the combination of thermal, photo, and voltaic. The importance of this is in energy storage, because thermal batteries are one-tenth the cost of lithium-ion batteries, and thermophotovoltaics are seen as the key to unlocking energy storage via heat rather than via batteries. And it works because of the inherent properties of NMP junctions and that the difference in temperature will create an electrical output. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video. Thank you very much for watching and please do remember to like and subscribe.